Welcome back to Honored Madman, and today I think we've got a pretty good one for you guys. We're finally going to talk about my favorite demigod, Rikard, or Richard, as he's affectionately known around here. But more specifically, we're going to be talking about the events that led up to the founding of Volcano Manor, as well as the events that led to its current state of being. But first, intros and all that. So, as many of us know, Rikard is one of the children of Renala, the Lunar Witch and Governor of Lyurnia's very own Hogwarts, Rhea Lucaria Academy, and Radagon of the Golden Order, the duplicitous science project of Queen Merica that had gone astray. It's unknown what kind of relationship Rikard had with his parents, but it can be assumed that he was on at least somewhat good terms with his mother, as at the very least, the architecture of Volcano Manor seems to resemble that of Rey Lucaria or Carrion Manor or a mix between the two. His later crusades against the Golden Order seem to indicate that he wasn't too big a fan of his father, though. But I'm skipping too far ahead already. While his brother Radon was considered the strongest primate high schooler and quickly rose up to become a famous general, Reichardt instead chose to be a wandering lawman of sorts. It's said that he was a ruthless gesture. As usual, don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but have fun with that in the comments. But it was said that much like Jules Winfield of Pulp Fiction fame, Rikard metaphorically and literally walked the earth. However, it is also said that he did so in the company of a group of ruthless inquisitors. So it's not like he walked the earth alone. It's also worth mentioning that Rikard and his siblings, Rani and Radon, weren't necessarily born demigods. They're demigod stepchildren, and they didn't necessarily even become demigod stepchildren until America recalled Radagon and had a couple of kids with him. So they, at the very least, spent a portion of their life without that whole I'm a demigod power complex going over their head. Which is also kind of hilariously why the narrator in the opening credits tries to blame the shattering on, well, who other than the demigod stepchildren? That's why it shows Rikard getting eaten by a snake when he says, The mad taint of their newfound strength triggered the shattering. I know it gets confusing with the whole Radagon and Merica thing, but they were initially just the offspring of a very powerful queen, Rinala, and presumably a champion of the Golden Order, not a Elden Lord, not a god, just a really powerful warrior who later did in fact turn out to be either Merica's science project or Merica herself going into disguise because she couldn't beat Renala at war, so instead she figured she could seduce her and make her crumble from the inside, leave her a broken husk. I don't think that one's that likely though. I think that it's more likely that Merica created Radagon as a sort of means to escape the greater will, like she created him using Nox rituals and science, and presumably tried to pour all of what was her that was also the Greater Wills and Golden Order into this science project, which later became Radagon. And when that didn't truly free her, she figured she would just send him to war against Renala, hoping he would perish, since the Lunar Queen had repelled all of the Golden Order's previous attempts to conquer Lyurnia. Which is why it's so interesting that he married Renala. I'm assuming he knew he'd never be able to beat the sorcerers in their war, but if he went on the inside, he could learn all of their secrets, Shit, the dude was even allowed to make policy changes in House Caria. He was the one who made the Perceptors wear masks. He made all things magical to be this whole secretive thing amongst the royals. He did a lot of damage to Carrion culture when he was there, let's just say that. And then once he learned everything he needed and had created a significant amount of heirs, including one Empyrean in the form of Rani, he was recalled to Landell where he and Merica created the twin demigods, Mikola and Melania. Either through conventional or unconventional means. That's where the whole theory gets a little blurry. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracking this whole thing. That was just me exp explaining my whole Radagon is a science project gone astray theory. I figured now is as good a time as any to say it, but we're getting off subject here. Now, as I was saying before I rudely interrupted myself, Rikard walked the earth with a band of ruthless inquisitors. He's one of the few people, well, historical people in Elden Ring that have traveled beyond the Lands Between because we know that Elmer of the Briar came from somewhere that was beyond the Lands Between. But it was during these travels that Rikard met the dancer Tanith. 
It said his dance charmed the Praetor, and that he made her his consort almost instantly. And it was said that at that point, she was perpetually seen by her lord's side. And Richard was a pretty outspoken dude, like for example, when his stepmother banished all of the Tarnished and their lord Godfrey from the Lands Between, he was one of the only people that actually questioned her decision. Not that it really mattered at all, but still, it, ma it means something. And sure, Richard probably only questioned Merica's decision because she was his stepmother and he felt like undermining her. But the man was inquisitive by nature. I mean, he led a band of inquisitors. He liked to question shit. And what happens when you question the established order? Well, you get labeled as blasphemous. Now, at some point, either prior to Rikard's leaving the Lands Between or after, he went down into Mount Gelmir, an ancient vex-filled volcano said to be home of an ancient, somewhat eldritch serpent. It's unknown if Rikard joined the cult of the uh, of Igle, the great serpent of Mount Gelmir. He was clearly interested enough in these hexes to the point where he wanted to modernize some of them and turn them into conventional sorceries. But one of the descriptions specifically mentions that his sorceries were said to represent the fury of the volcano, but this arrogance of attempting to harness it is solely that of men and serpents. So it could be that him and Igle are in a similar boat, or at least initially at this point. They both attempted to harness the power of the volcano but could arguably never quite control it, at least individually. And I think it's safe to say the fact that Rikard chose Malgelmir to establish his manor and then call it Volcano Manor is evidence enough that he wanted to be closer to this great power, whether this great power was the ancient serpent that lived in the volcano or this volcano itself. And we can speculate for a bit, just what is Igle? I mean, I'm not really entirely sure, I just know it's a big snake. Some have proposed the idea that that's all Igle is, is just a big snake, but I think it might be a little more complicated than that. Perhaps it started as a big snake, and one day that big snake fell into the volcano that is Mount Gilmir, at which point the volcano, which could possibly be a living entity all on its own, assimilated this big snake and sort of turned it into an avatar of sorts, a physical manifestation, if you will, using the snake as its visage. And one day, good old Richard showed up, and basically the same thing happened to him, except the snake would then tempt him to, in essence, become one with the volcano by way of feeding himself to the great serpent. And with Richard coming from demigod stock, this undoubtedly greatly powered up the snake. In fact, Rikard was so powerful, it seems like the two beings merged into one new being. Or the volcano just assimilated old Richie boy the same way it did the snake, but I like to think that he's still holding on. I'm pretty sure it's him that's talking to us in this second phase and not the snake and that would be why the boss title changes to Rikard, but at the end of the day, who knows. The other possibility for this uh, big snake is that it's just an eldritch creature that's responsible for all the weirdness that goes on at Mount Gilmer. And that the volcano itself isn't living or a powerful entity, it's the serpent that's responsible for why the magma and all the things that happen and the hexes around Mount Gilmer are happening. I feel like that's the easier and probably more likely answer. But aside from all that, there's the fact also that Igle is invariably or most likely tied to the Godskin Apostles, which I've already talked about a little bit and I don't want to derail the whole video with this, but I think Igle is what birthed the Godskins, perhaps out of some unholy union with the Glomide Queen. I mean, the Godskins are able to manifest these inhuman physiologies, which sure, that could just be their association with the crucible but there's something strikingly serpentine about at least the apostle the noble on the other hand i mean he kind of seems like how some of the snake men have these bloated heads and all that but honestly i don't want to get too off track but i just wanted to speculate for a little bit back to the lore so Rikard establishes his manor. It looks a bit like Ray Lucari academy it looks a bit like carrion manor it's got little bits of uh, his background and Rikard's natural charisma and fame as this great leader and wandering lawman attracts him a great deal of followers to the point where he had a very well-stocked army and extremely loyal and devoted knights. Some of his nobles even possessed bloodhound knights, which was a rather common thing amongst carrion nobles if we uh, look around a bit in the game. They seem to often be places where the carrions might have been, like Kaelid or Ray Lucaria or Volcano Manor, but I digress. Now here's where things start to get a little more interesting. 
At some point prior to the famous shattering, Reichard would assist his sister Rani in orchestrating the events that would lead to the notorious Night of Black Knives, where good old Godwin got Swiss cheesed. Now the exact nature of his involvement is as of yet unclear, but it must have been significant since Rani gifted him with these traces of the Rune of Death in the form of the Blasphemous Claw, which allowed him to parry Malekith and challenge the Keeper of the Rune of Death if he ever needed to, like if uh, Malekith ever came seeking some kind of revenge for Rykard's involvement in this theft that had humiliated him so. Now when it comes to how Rykard assisted Rani in this heist, I've got two main theories. The first has to do with the fact that we know that the assassins were all Newman women who had close ties to America herself. It's not impossible that Rykard had several of these women abducted using his abductor virgin machines and then teleported somewhere where he could kind of just operate on them because we know he likes to experiment on things. I mean, look at the Albinorix you see all throughout Volcano Manor. But turn them into some type of crazy sleeper agent. Program them, if you will. And then either send them back to reblend back into the, uh, the household of America or wherever they were taken from, or just hang on to them until you want to send them and have all these demigods killed. I think the former seems more likely than the latter, but you never know because there's that whole scene in the trailer where they're all riding like the fucking Nazgul and all that. Anyway, my other theory has to do with that he literally helped Rani get to Farrah Missoula to steal the rune. Now this one's also tenuous at best. I mean, they're both just kind of uh, crackpot theories. I think it's entirely possible that Rykard could have used four belfries to get Rani to Farrah Missoula to steal this rune of death from Malekith. I mean, it's located in Liernia near their family's lands, why not? Maybe she needed Rykard to make her some kind of phony imbued sword key to use the teleporter. Or maybe she had him lock all the teleporters after her theft, scatter the imbued sword keys. I don't know, those are my two working theories for the, uh, the theft of the Rune of Death. But anyway, back to uh, the Blasphemous Claw. Now, the important thing to note from the Blasphemous Claw's description is that Rykard was willing to challenge Malekith if need be. Now, everybody else, every other demigod is afraid of Malekith. He's known as the bane of the demigods. Everybody was afraid of him. It was said that he was the only thing that these spoiled demigods feared. But our boy Rykard here is simply built different. And in the early days of Volcano Manor, it was truly a home of heroes and champions. All drawn to the leadership of this regal motherfucker, Rykard. I mean, he literally looks like what a sovereign should look like, IMO. He's the most Godfrey looking out of all of them. If we're going off of his portraits, at least. Now, when the Shattering first rolled around and all the demigods started warring against each other, Volcano Manor was initially, uh, unshaken. Reichard initially saw no reason to war against his siblings and step-siblings over these runes, these fragments and vestiges of a god that he had planned to overthrow. So Reichard, being Reichard, did the only practical thing he could think of, and that was to wage war against the very gods themselves. And wage war he did, I mean, while his brother Radon was attempting to sack the capital, Rykard's forces were engaging the Golden Order's forces in the mountains near Gelmir in what became the most long-running and bloody battle in the Erdtree and Lands Between's history. I mean, you've got Landell soldiers on that mountainside succumbing to frenzy because of the horrors they saw on this battlefield. No side won at the never-ending battles of Mount Gelmir. I mean, they're still there to this day in the game, still fighting it out. Rykar's machines and automatons and marionette soldiers and the frenzied Landale soldiers all still fighting in an unending conflict. And as these brutal wars and conflicts went on, as well as his presumably dwindling resources, and all of that paired with a lack of progress to their ultimate goal of overthrowing the Erd Tree, drove Rykar's ambitions to take a rather blasphemous turn. In this case, he took the most unconventional route of all and fed himself to the giant serpent that resided in Mount Gelmir, the one known as Aigle, who may or may not have also been responsible for the godskin apostles and nobles that the Glomite Queen used to wreak havoc on the lands between not too long ago. It's interesting because the godskins have been noted to have assumed inhuman physiology not unlike the Crucible, but with the tails and all that and the scales. If you take a look around the Temple of Aigle, where a godskin noble is found, there are several statues of what appears to be a winged serpent with uh, 
bird-like talon feet. And so you're probably thinking, oh, this must be Igle. But Igle is a giant serpent. It doesn't have wings. It doesn't have uh, feathers. But if we look at any of the crucible talismans, we know that scales and tails and feathers, wings and the like, are all things humans of the ancient crucible used to possess. They were all things that humans had, horns and all. So it appears to just be depicting what a life form might have looked like during the crucible, not necessarily any one specific life form, but you know, everything was blended back then, so that was just what humans were. At the end of the day, the Godskin Noble and the Godskin Apostle are just stand-ins for George R. R. Martin and Hidetaka Miyazaki, respectively. Anyway, back to the video. This unending, ongoing war would also turn the area around Mount Gelmir into a type of horrors of war sort of situation. And it was at this point that a good number of his initial loyal knights and soldiers abandoned him or were eaten and forced to join the family of serpents. And by joining the serpent family, he means as a rancor, which is one of the flaming skulls he sends at you during his boss fight. Those are what became of all the heroes that were consumed by the great serpent and Rikard. But with most of his initial followers either dead or fled, with one of them even having tried to use the serpent slayer blade to slay Rikard, he and his consort Tanith needed to supply their halls with new warriors. As Rikard became more and more consumed by his ambition, Tanith took over operations at Volcano Manor and restructured things. Now it was during this restructuring of things that it's believed the Serpent Men came into existence. It's believed that the Serpent, Igle, and Rikard combo mated with a human female named Dedekar who had her skin flayed as part of a ritualistic process and birthed a myriad of grotesque children. It was also said that she indulged in every form of adultery and wicked pleasure imaginable. Now, I should keep going on, but I feel like I should cover this a little bit. Now, the skin being flayed from this uh, being, this data car, this mysterious figure in Elden Ring's history, brings to mind Dominula Village, which is a village filled with women who all have their skin flayed. And they appear to be in worship of a godskin apostle who happens to be hanging out at the top of the hill. I think it's possible there's some relation here because there is a whole godskin noble and black flame monk chilling in front of the temple of Igle, which is located in Volcano Manor. I think the skin being flayed off as part of the ritual has more to do with the fact that uh, a snake sheds their skin, so maybe just conceiving a god with a giant eldritch snake isn't enough and you have to have your skin flayed off as part of a ritual to birth all these little snake men that would later be used to garrison Volcano Manor. And one of these beings specifically would be known as Zorias and be raised by Tanith. Who knows what specifically separated her from the rest. Perhaps she inherited a little more humanity than her colleagues. But Tanith treated Zorias as if she was her own daughter. She even gave her a job that was integral to the success of Volcano Manor's new mission, which was to recruit any and all tarnished it could to its cause of destroying the Erd Tree and killing all other tarnished who happened to be attempting to become Elden Lord. Tanith would send Zorias all across the lands between in search of these new potential warriors and recruits, eventually amassing a rather respectable band of killers, well, aside from Dialos, that is. I mean, even Patches the Cockroach has found his way to Volcano Manor, and that guy has seen the very end of the Dark Souls timeline. Let's just say he knows a thing or two about serving an eldritch horror. Now, since the road to Volcano Manor had become somewhat of a no-man's land full of, uh, still ongoing brutal warfare, this also usually meant that whoever did find the manor this way was a pretty skilled warrior or at the very least, a very fast runner. The other ways into Volcano Manor involve either a teleportation on invite from Zorias and the secret way in that Patches suggests, which involves going down to the bottom of Rey Lucarian Academy and letting yourself be abducted by an abductor virgin. However, this transports you to a separate section of Volcano Manor where you have to fight two named abductors that hint at these monstrosities' origins. They're notably called Inquisitors, so that leads me to believe that Rikard, using his various knowledge of mad science and magic, turned the Inquisitors that used to follow him around the world into these, uh, well, I don't know what to call them, war machines capable of abducting people and teleporting them to a hidden torture chamber. Now, it is possible that the Inquisitors just inspired these abductor virgins, but I think it's also just as likely that some of them did, in fact, get turned into them. Tanith would also set up a unique hunting system that was similar to an average RPG's assassin guild. 
Her scouts would track the location of a tarnish that was deemed worthy to be hunted. This tarnish name and location would wind up on what's called a red letter, and then the red letter would be given to one of her tarnished hunters to go carry out the grim task. Rewards for these tasks varied, from magma sorceries to literal artifacts and tools of Rikard himself. The ultimate goal, however, was a meeting with the Great One. Now, unbeknownst to the attendee of this meeting, they were going to be eaten and turned into a rancor. It's not hard to see at this point that the people of Volcano Manor, Rikard, Tanith, they'd all kind of lost their way a bit. They weren't really fighting the Ur Tree, they were just giving Rikard more souls to presumably get stronger to the point where he finally was ready to go fight, I don't know, the Ur Tree, the Elden Beast. Doesn't seem like he had much interest in that anymore, honestly. Maybe now that him and the Serpent have fused, they can finally control the mountain, and they're just content to sit on their ass since no one can really do anything about it except for a particularly skilled Tarnished. But again, I digress. Or at best, Volcano Manor's ultimate goal had now become a salvage effort. Tanith had decided that the best way to preserve Richard's original vision for Volcano Manor was to prevent any Tarnish from becoming Elden Lord. Figuring that if they couldn't beat the Golden Order at war, then the next best thing was to just keep them godless. This was probably the best possible move Tanith could have made as the interim leader, but defeating your own best killers and warriors to Rykard seems a bit counterproductive, if you ask me. Especially ones as valuable as like the player character Tarnished or Bernal, it just seems pointless to feed them to Rykard. Also, if you want to get to Rykard without taking part in the whole Volcano Manor questline, you have to go through what I like to call the Chief Snake Man's Worship Room, in which you will encounter that's right, you guessed it, the Chief Snake Man with his big ass bloated head. The Volcano Manor was, if nothing else, not a particularly welcoming place. But that didn't stop the manor from becoming home to a considerably diverse populace. I've already mentioned the Abductor Virgins, the Snake Men, the Godskin Nobles, and the Tortured Albinorix. There's also what remains of Volcano Manor's servant population, who now seem to use poison-type attacks. There's also snail snakes, at least one mostly docile bloodhound knight. There's also an omen killer here located in the prison town section, and judging by the lack of omens, I'd say he's no longer on duty or on the hunt. Maybe he got disillusioned with all the baby killing. It sort of makes sense that an omen killer would be here in opposition to the Erd Tree now, since it was the Golden Order that charged the omen killers with while well, dealing with the omen problem, which obviously affected the omen killers because they took, you know, spices that rid them of their emotions. And at the same time, maybe, maybe he's not. He is watching a guy burn at the stake, so it could be that that guy was uh, an omen, or worse, somebody who was harboring an omen. And I'm actually getting reports that that's uh, not the only omen killer in Volcano Manor. There's actually another one above the guest hall. This leads me to believe that these two omen killers just threw in their lot with Rykard and the Blasphemous. But I guess it's still just as likely that a pair of them was sent here to go hunt some omens. Interesting though that there are none to be found. Maybe they completed their task? Well then, why are they hanging out here still? Perhaps it's both. Perhaps they came here to hunt an omen and they did and then they saw how things were and they're like, Hey, actually I might join up with old Richard and his merry band of snakes. We also see several depraved perfumers wear snakes on their apron, which is sort of a symbol of opposition to the Erd Tree. Maybe they're loyal to Rikard too, or at least in spirit. There's also a bunch of the dreaded meatball Albinorix here at Volcano Manor, and I hate these guys. These guys have a grab animation that you just, uh, if you miss that attack, they just grab you and they swarm you and grab you and grab you. They're not hard to deal with, I just, you know, they're like the things in Bloodborne, the head suckers. At first I thought maybe the experiments going on at Volcano Manor were what turned some of these Albinorix into the meatball head ones, but they're seen in too many places to have originated here in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm right, I don't know, I'm still not sold either way on that one. They also might just be flawed or imperfect Albinorix. Since the Albinorix as a whole are artificial life forms, it's highly possible that mistakes could happen in their creation, resulting in, well, a percentage of their population developing meatball heads. But what do I know? I'm no Nox scientist. But yeah, last but not least, there's also a ghost that haunts the halls of Volcano Manor. This particular entity was presumably Rykard's last loyal knight, and this knight tried to take the Serpent Slayer Blade and do away with Rykard and the Great Serpent, only to meet his end. 
but he wasn't devoured, possibly because Rykard didn't want to give him that honor as if it was some kind of honor at all anyway. But I think that's why his spirit didn't turn into a rancor and instead he's able to just kind of haunt the halls of Volcano Manor, imploring every visitor to accomplish the task he failed at so long ago. It is interesting to note though that Rykard denying this knight the supposed honor of being devoured is what leads to the demigod's eventual death. I used to think maybe Rykard did this because a part of him wanted to die, but I find that highly unlikely now. I think he truly thought he was just denying this knight an honor of some kind, and it hilariously results in his eventual demise at the hands of us, the playa. I almost forgot about the magma worm living underneath Volcano Manor, but that's there too. And shit, I forgot about the magma slugs and basilisks, and oh, did I forget to mention that those poison peasants that I talked about earlier, yeah, they explode when you kill them with like a poisony mist, which is likely the result of Richard's mad science hijinks. Maybe he's trying to turn these peasants into serpents in spirit. Or maybe there's a serpent hive mind that's controlling them now, who knows. Now, in spite of how inhospitable this place was, over the years they managed to recruit a number of powerful tarnished. Mainly ones that had lost their way due to the cards they had been dealt, or no longer could see grace, or some other personal tragedy. Warriors like Knight Bernal, a stalwart badass that the Beastmen had put their faith in to become Elden Lord. However, he lost his own faith when he saw his maiden cast herself into the Flame of Ruin. Bernal was one of two Tarnished to come extremely close to becoming Elden Lord. The other was Vike, the famous dragon fucker who fell to the Frenzied Flame. Now, Bernal became a very prolific member of Volcano Manor and made it a point to only hunt high-profile Tarnished. But he was also a man of many faces, and during the start of the game, he can be found in the woods, posing as a simple weapons trainer. He also might be training or evaluating the nearby recusant Henricus's abilities, since he is also a member of Volcano Manor and he has an invasion point nearby. And the interesting thing about Henricus is that he's not exactly a true believer. He's actually a spy for Sakidian Opnia. They all know him. Yep, you got that right. He works for Elden Ring's very own Odin. Now, I would say most folks probably already know that, especially if you're here watching an Elden Ring lore video. But, you know, any excuse to use that little clip is just too good. And a lot of good all that spying did old Henricus, though. I imagine he was dropped off into old Big Snake Rick's arena with the intention of him being killed rather than eaten to deny him of the supposed honor of being consumed by the serpent. Similar to the ghost man who gives us the instructions to find the serpent hunter blade. Or on the flip side, maybe Henricus was just really good at being undercover. Maybe he was like uh, Matthew McConaughey from True Detective. He was stacking these tarnished bodies 10 feet high and it got him an audience with Rykard where he was promptly, you know, eaten or maybe just half eaten and spit out because that's why we're able to find his body. I mean, who knows? I suppose one is just as likely as the other though. I guess I should mention Dialos too, who hilariously joined Volcano Manor after his personal assistant was murdered by recusants. That's right, the very residence of Volcano Manor, what he's now joined itself. He claims to have done this as sort of revenge, planning to take them all out from the inside, but he's nowhere near skilled enough, and if you play through the quest line, you end up killing his much stronger and capable older brother. My problem with Dialos is that he is a failure, a standout failure, in a game full of failures. Like, I mean, everybody failed. Radagon failed, Malekith failed, Radon failed, Morgoth, failed. everybody failed. Richard definitely fucking failed. My problem with Dialos is that he was this spoiled kid. He's a child playing at war. And then when he goes to Jarberg, he's a child playing as protector. And sure, he would have never been accepted as their potentate were it not for his soft, pampered hands, but this directly leads to Jarberg being massacred. So in literally every other playthrough, I look at Dialos as a sort of Metal Gear Solid style question, where I think they ask Snake, you know, would you kill one to save many? And he's like, of course I would, in a heartbeat. At least I think that was Metal Gear Solid. I can't remember, that might have been like um, Splinter Cell, but you get what I mean. I eliminate Dialos as soon as I see him in Lyernia Swamps, and I usually never have to deal with him again. It was only in a recent playthrough that I forgot to do that and saw him at Volcano Manor and was like, ah, shit. But yeah, back to the video. Good. 
Now, even with all these capable warriors that Tanith managed to round up, the overall progress towards overthrowing the Erdtree and devouring the very gods themselves had pretty much grounded to a halt. Tanith redirected her attention to eliminating any and all tarnished who might have the chance to become Elden Lord, which at the end of the day was just a way for her to stall time for Rykard, who may never even be ready to take on the gods themselves. It's kind of a shame the grand goal, the noble goal of overthrowing the Erdtree has kind of just become sort of a dream, honestly. I mean, the people at Volcano Manor, specifically Burnall, they still fully believe in it, that one day they might be able to overthrow these gods. But that comes down to my problem with the endings. I mean, the lack of a Rykard ending is what's called blasphemous. And also there's no Mog ending, and both of these factions feel like they should have had some kind of ending involved, but they didn't. Maybe it'll be in DLC, but I wouldn't hold my breath. It's interesting how Volcano Manor started out as this actual threat to the Erdtree, led by this super competent and charismatic and ruthless leader, but his ambitions gave way to depravity and gluttony and all that shit, which resulted in his subordinate having to take the reins from him and realizing the situation, she dealt with it the best way she could, or at least the best way she thought she could. And we can't blame Tanith for that, I mean, she was kind of put in this impossible situation after Rykar decided to feed himself to a snake. And you know, she was a pretty good mother to Zarias, and a pretty solid leader for the remnants of Volcano Manor. Again, it's just a shame that she's that devoted to this cause that she's willing to devour all of Rykard's corpse after we've defeated him so that the serpent family can live on within her. I think it's supposed to just be kind of a, a, a tragic scene when we see her there trying to eat Rykard's corpse because I think she's unable to deal with how everything fell apart. And her hopelessly trying to eat Rykard's corpse can be seen as a sort of consequence to this great lord's ambition and the price that was paid by his followers. The cost of ambition, if you will. And I think that's the overall purpose of Patches having us deliver to Tanith her bracelets from her past life as a dancer and her, like, rejecting them and shunning them. It's there to show us that she's fully consumed with the ideals of Rykard and the Serpent. At least that's how I read it. And it makes the quest feel a little less unfinished. At the end of the day, Volcano Manor will remain as a monument to all of Rykard's sins quote an achievement I just got on the last great Halo game, Halo Reach. And as of right now, that's uh, all I have to say about Rykard and Volcano Manor currently, at least until I uh, go a little more in detail on the uh, Bernal video. And if you guys got through all of that rambling and getting sidetracked, I really appreciate it. If you liked the video, please uh, consider dropping a like. If you disliked it, please dislike it. And if you like these videos and want to see more of them, then maybe consider subscribing. It would really help the channel out. YouTube's kind of a mess right now. I know I always say that, but it's always true. Plus, I would really appreciate it. Uh, if you want to follow me somewhere else, you could find me on uh, Instagram at Honored Madman. But yeah, let's, uh, let's have our outro. And we know that Rykard and Rani had a lot in common. He was even an accomplice in her plot. And the two had very similar goals. They wanted to overthrow the Golden Order and free themselves from the Greater Will. They just happened to go about it in two very different ways. And while we don't really know what Rykard's relationship with Radon was like, I know a lot of people think Radon was like a Golden Order fanboy, but I think that's a bit unfair. He was clearly a Godfrey fanboy, but I don't think he was a Golden Order fanboy. The guy practiced gravity magic, that's not very Golden Order-like. But regardless on the respective sides the brothers found themselves on during the shattering and the conflicts that followed, Rykard still cared very much about his brother Radon and has him honored with a very cool portrait in Volcano Manor. So I got both Hogwarts Legacy and Yakuza Ishin. Well, technically I'm waiting on Yakuza Ishin to download, but I don't know if you guys are uh, fans of the Yakuza series, but I sure as hell am. In fact, one of my most popular videos is just a Yakuza meme. But I've been wanting to do a video that covered all one through sixes, and I'm still currently like uh, working on that, like I'm playing through, I need to play through six and five again. But I know I've got Fallout videos coming, Zelda videos coming, and uh, definitely probably a Hogwarts Legacy one coming. But there should be some Yakuza shit mixed, thrown in the mix too. I mean, I'm getting, I'm trying to get back to my more frequent uploading schedule. I know this one is like 12 days later and all that, but um, 
I wanted to get a few more of these Elden Ring videos out before I go full blast into like other games. I'm never gonna not do Elden Ring and FromSoft stuff, but I need to replay the uh, the Golden Trilogy of Dark Souls and all that and Bloodborne to refresh myself on that lore. So that's definitely gonna come too. Again, this is all just me plugging future nonsense. So uh, with all that being said, I'm signing off. You guys have a good one. Are you surprised that I belong to the Volcano Manor? I always hated the gibberish about Lost Grace and the laughable Two Fingers. I thought I could lend a hand in unmasking the charade. Not to mention, Tanith has always made me curious. I guess her master must really be something, because she's pretty damn smug about it. Even after announcing her blasphemous ambitions, she still stands proud. I've never seen a woman quite like her.